Amen. How many of you all believe an incredible God deserves an incredible praise? Come on now, I know the song is over, but the reality is not over. We serve an incredible God, and he deserves an incredible praise. I want to encourage you right now, right where you are, in the midst of your living room, in your car, um, at your desk, on your job, wherever you are, I want to encourage you to give God an incredible praise because we serve an incredible God. We serve a reliable God. We serve a loving God. We serve a God who has infinitesimally showed us grace and showed us mercy and showed us his love. So I want to welcome you all to worship an incredible God who's worthy of incredible praise. You know, this month is, is, is the month of celebrating Christmas. And the essence of Christmas is the incarnation of Christ. That's a fancy term for God taking on flesh in the form of Jesus Christ and dwelling among us. If there's no other reason to praise him, the fact that he came from heaven to earth to show us the way is, a, is, is, is enough reason to praise him and to glorify him and to celebrate him and to gather for him. So I want to encourage you guys. We serve an incredible God who's worthy of incredible praise. And I want to encourage you to worship him all this month. Glory to his name. Amen. Glory to his name. Amen. Just type amen into your chat. You know what, I, you, you probably can't spell it, but just type hallelujah in your chat. But it, it don't matter how I come out, just put it in the chat, amen? Because our God is worthy. Let's pray. God, we thank you, we praise you, we love you. We celebrate you, God, because there is none like you, oh God. So God, we come this morning, God, to ask the Lord you would speak to us. We pray, God, that you would have your way in our midst, God. We pray, God, that you would encourage us, edify us, inspire us, Lift us, elevate us, God. Direct us. I pray, God, we can be all the things you call us to be today, God. So I'm not sure, God, where your people are and what they're encountering, what they're experiencing. But I want to pray, God, that, Lord, they have an encounter with you today. I want to pray, God, it's not just merely perfunctory. I want to pray, God, it's just not merely a formality. I want to pray, God, that, Lord, we encounter you, Father. I pray it's not just merely an intellectual activity, but I pray, God, that, Lord, you would meet us here today. And I pray, God, wherever we are, that you would take us to that next step where you want us to be. Lord, remove the distractions right now. Whether it's the telephone, it's the computer, it's the game we got on, Lord, on the TV while we got our iPads, our iPhones, and our computers on, God. Lord, remove the distractions so we can hear from you. Now, Lord, speak to us. Empower us like only you can. It's in Jesus' name, pronounce ask it all. Amen? Amen. I type amen to your chat. You know, I was thinking about today's sermon, and you all know I love songs and I love music, and I want to open my sermon with a song today. I'm, I'm not going to tell you the name of the song. I'm not going to tell you the artist. I would sing it, but y'all don't want to hear me sing. You want to hear me preach. Smile at me, all right? And so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to give you a, I'm going to do a concert one day. But until then, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read these lyrics, and um, I'm going to try not to, to well, add my own melody to it, but <coughs> I'll tell you who it is at the end, but, but you all probably figured out. It says, with all my heart, I love you, baby. Stay with me, and you will see my arms will hold you, baby. Never leave, because I believe I'm in love. Sweet love, hear me calling out your name. I feel no shame, I'm in love. Sweet love, don't you ever go away. It'll always be this way. Your heart has called me closer to you. I will be all that you need, just trust in what we're feeling. Never leave, cause baby, I believe in this love. Sweet love, hear me calling out your name. I feel no shame, I'm in love. Sweet love, don't ever go away. It'll always be this way. There's no stronger love in the world. Oh, baby, no, you're my man. I'm your girl. I'll never go and wait. Wait and see. I can't be wrong. Don't you know this is where you belong? How sweet this dream. How lovely, baby. Stay right here. Never fear. I will be all that you need. Never leave because, baby, I believe in this love. 
Sweet love, hear me calling out your name. I feel no shame. I'm in love, sweet love. Don't you ever go away. It'll always be this love. Um, um, be this way. You all know those lyrics. It's by the songstress Anita Baker. If my memory serves me correct, that is one of the two of the first albums I ever placed. And she's my homegirl. She's from Detroit. And boy, it was an incredible song, Sweet Love. And boy, it was all over the radio. And boy, I would put it in the, I would put it in the cassette when I was driving around town in my mom's Dodge 600 that I eventually tore up. Smile at me already. But what I, that, that song, Sweet Love, talked about a relationship. It talked about a connection, and it talked about this, this, this romance that, that boy, this guy and this girl would have together, and she, and she called it sweet love. You know, I want to ask you a question today. When you think about your relationship with Jesus Christ, do you think about sweet love? But could we use these same words? You know, boy, just edit it just a little bit. Could we use these same words? to talk about your love relationship with God. Yeah. Could we talk about, boy, you love him not just positionally, but you love him personally. When you think about your, um, 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 your love relationship with Christ, do you think about how much God loves you and, and God wants an intimate relationship with you? And boy, when it comes to Christmas, our regeneration ought to be a cause of our celebration. Our salvation ought to be a cause for us to celebrate God, to magnify God, to lift God up for who he is and what he does. It's sweet love. I love you, baby, God is trying to say. You know, I thought about this whole idea of love and a love relationship. And so I went online and so you know what? What are the characteristics of a healthy love relationship? The article um, it, it said it had 15 things, but as I was reading through the article, they left off number 14, so there were only really of, of, of 14 things they listed. But when it comes to a love relationship and our love relationship with God, what are the characteristics of a healthy love relationship? Now, well, this list is not inspired. It's not, a, it's not a God-given list, but I think that most of these things can be found in Scripture to, to, to epitomize a healthy relationship with God. Number one is respect for one another. Number two is to be vulnerable with one another. Number three is to totally trust one another. Number four is an unwavering honesty with one another. Number five is a mutual empathy. Number six is to prioritize kindness. Number seven is to respect boundaries. Number eight is to be totally committed. Number nine is thoughtfulness. Number 10 is forgiving. Number 11 is to be gentle. Number 12 is to have lots of affection. Number 13 is to be consistently appreciating the other person. And number 14 of their list of 15 is to validate one another. Let me ask you a question. When it comes to your love relationship with God, does sweet love characterize your relationship? Do these 14 characteristics on an article that said it had 15 things, smile at me. Does that characterize your love relationship with God? I want to talk today about the gift of relationship. In this series, we're talking about Christmas gifts. God's gifts to you. And boy, as we approach Christmas, many of us are getting ready Black Friday and boy, picking up deals and purchasing gifts. But let me ask you a question. Do you recognize the gifts that God has given you as a believer? Do you recognize the gifts available to believers in Jesus Christ? If you're not a Christ follower, I want to encourage you. There are some benefits. There are some gifts. There are some bonuses to a relationship with Jesus Christ. But you know what, though? When it comes to, when it comes to Christianity and a relationship with God, there's this dichotomy. There's this argument that goes back and forth about is Christianity a religion or is Christianity a relationship? And the answer is yes. Smile at me. You know, we talk about Christianity um, 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 not being a religion, but technically Christianity is a religion. In James chapter 1, he makes reference to true and pure and undefined religion. Christianity is a religion in the sense 
It's a particular system of faith or worship. However, when we speak about religion in contrast to a relationship, we're not speaking about a particular system of worship, but external rules and regulations with no corresponding internal reality. So boy, our society and our culture, they are tired of religion. They are tired of rules and regulations. They are tired of external rules that don't impact an individual's heart. They are tired of, of, of things being said on the outside but don't manifest themselves on the inside. And so in the sense that, 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 that Christianity is a faith system, it is a belief in God, it is a religion. But it's not only a religion, it's more so about a relationship. So what happens is people argue about, well, but it's not a religion, it's a relationship. It's actually both. And so we're talking about um, a relationship in most religions, watch this now, in most religions, it's what you have to do for God to be right with that God. But in Christianity, it's not about primarily what you do for God. It's about what God has already done for you. In the most systems, it's about works, it's about legalism, it's about effort. But in Christianity, it's about grace, it's about mercy, it's about sanctification. It's about Christ taking your place on the cross and dying in your place and him making you worthy and him making you suitable and him making you appropriate. It's distinct and different from any other religion. And then watch this now, then he invites you to a relationship. Matthew 11 says, Come unto me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, because I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your soul. How many of you all need rest today? How many of you all need peace today? How many of you all need somebody to help you carry your load today? Never get to a point to where you believe you can carry life's load without Christ. We're not talking about being indigent. We're talking about being spiritually dependent. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 5, blessed are the, blessed are the, blessed are the pure. Blessed are those, watch this now, who are dependent upon God, who walk with God, who trust God, who live for God. Watch this now. How many of you all are utterly dependent upon God? How many of you all, watch this now, cultivate a relationship with him? So watch this. Now, I want to talk to you guys today about a relationship with him and the gift he has given us through a relationship with him. Can you all buckle your spiritual seatbelts? Can you all get your iPad out, turn to your Bible app, open your Bible, your Bible up? We're going to turn to some passages. Amen. But I want to start in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5. In Ephesians 2, verse 5, we, we preached from here on last week, and we talked about the gift of regeneration. We talked about what God had, um, how God has made us alive. We said in verse 1, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, count the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, watch this now, like the rest of mankind. So what he does here, he makes a distinction between Christ followers and non-Christ followers. He makes distinction between your life before Christ and now your life in Christ. The challenge is many people's lives don't look very much different from when they were not in Christ to when they are in Christ. And God says, you know what, there ought to be a distinction. Then he comes here in verse 4, says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, here's our term, made us alive together with Christ. Then he says, by grace you have been saved. Watch this now. A person is not saved by their efforts. They're not saved by their good deeds. They're not saved by their donations. They're not saved by their benevolence. They're not saved by their philanthropy. They're not saved by their contribution to the kingdom. We are saved by grace through faith. And so watch this now. Religion says you are saved by your good works. Religion says you are saved by your good deeds. 
Religion says you are saved by your community involvement. Religion says you are saved by your moralism. But watch this now. The Bible says we're not merely about a, um, a religion. We are about a relationship. And so we came to this um, passage last week. I emphasize what it means to be alive in contrast to being dead. I said, you know what, when, when we came to life in Christ, it was not the result of our own personal decision. It was the result of God um, taking the initiative to inaugurate and to initiate a relationship with us and that God made us alive and God made us alive, watch this now, by his mercy. God made us alive by his grace. God made us alive because of his love. It wasn't what we have done. It's what God has done. God has liberated us as believers. How many of you all know that when it comes to being alive, it's not primarily what you have done, it's what Christ has done. And that's in juxtaposition to what our culture teaches, to what our world is. Pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. That's nowhere in the Bible. And boy, you wouldn't have bootstraps if it wasn't for God. And so when we come here today, I want to emphasize, I really want to preach one word today. I want to preach one primary word and the implications and the explanation of one word. He says in this passage, in verse 5 again, he comes and he says this. He says, um, he says, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. On your iPad, underline that word, smile at me, made us alive. Type to your chat, made us alive. Alive. Better yet, if you're a Christ follower in that chat, type, he made me alive. How many of you all are thankful because he made you alive? You didn't make yourself alive. You didn't light your own wig. You didn't turn your own power on. It's what God did. The Bible clearly teaches that no one can come to him except he draw them. And so when we come here, he, he uses this word here. He says, made us alive together with Christ. You can't sit in the English, but in the Greek, this word made us alive together is actually a, 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 a word. It's a, it's a combination of a prefix and then two other words. The prefix is the Greek term soon, which means together. Then it's the term zoe, which means life. Then it's the term poeo, which means do or make. So when you put them together, he says you life or made alive, God has done. And so he's walking around, I have made you alive together with Christ. Right. So watch this now. Well, Pastor, what's the big deal, Pastor? I mean, this whole thing about with Christ. See, too many of us live life, but we don't live life dependent upon Christ. So watch this now. We think the Christian life is about what, about what we can do in our own power, with our own intelligence, with our own strength. But, but, but the reality is when you come to Christ, God gives you a new capacity. God changes what's happening on the inside. I recently got a um, uh, I recently got a new cell phone, but my cell phone boy, my, I got a relationship with my cell phone. Smile at me, all right? I mean, but, 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 but everywhere I go, my 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 phone is with me, and boy, I mean, but everywhere I go, I need my phone. I can do my Bible research. I can make phone calls. I can do emails. I can do Bible reading. I can listen to sermons. I mean, I can text. I mean, I can do. If I've got my if I've got my phone, I can roll. Just give me my phone and a power supply, and we good, all right? So I, I got this new phone, and boy, this new phone has the, it has the 5G technology. Smile at me. And so but it's got the 5G technology, and so to, um, um, historically, that boy, when you got a new phone, they would tell you to, to take your SIM card out of your old phone and put your SIM card inside your new phone. Well, boy, a SIM card, it simply means a subscriber identity module. A subscriber identity module. So, boy, I'm, I'm going through here, and boy, we swapping out phones for the kids, boy, giving them an upgrade so the kids get our old phones. And I got my wife a new phone, so a new phone as well. And so, boy, I took out the SIM card of the old, and I put the new SIM card in the old phone, I put the old SIM card in my new phone. And then, boy, things just weren't working right, and so I called a Verizon person, and they said, well, sir, it seems like the new SIM card is inside the old phone. And, boy, um, um, under the new phone for the 5G technology, you've got to keep the new SIM card in the new phone if you want to enjoy the new features. 
How many of you all know that when you came to Christ, God made you alive. God gave you a new spiritual SIM card. Well, boy, what does the SIM card do? Boy, the SIM card has to do with information. The SIM card has to do with identification. The SIM card has to do with communication. And the SIM card has to do with authorization. So watch this now. Too many of us have come to Christ, but we still are functioning based upon the old SIM card rather than the new SIM card that we have. He's given us new information. He's given us a new identification. He's got a new means of communication with us. And now he's given us new authorization because we are in Jesus Christ. But the problem is we can't celebrate at Christmas our relationship because we stuck on religion. We stuck on what we can do rather than what Christ does for us, in us, through us, with us, and in spite of us. And so I want to encourage you guys today, if you're a believer in Christ, you've got a relationship. And that, boy, this relationship is incredible. We serve an incredible God. We want to give him incredible praise. And, boy, he's given us a relationship. So, boy, in the theological world, there's these um, two terms, not only two terms, but there are at least two terms. And we talk about this idea of Calvinism, and then we talk about Arminianism, then we talk about Pelagianism, then we talk about semi-Pelagianism. But watch this now. Uh, um, Arminianism is dangerous because Arminianism says we got to give God a kickstand. Arminianism says we, we've got to help God out. Arminianism says, you know what? God did not initiate salvation. We initiated salvation. And the problem with that is that, boy, the Bible says we were born in sin and shaping in iniquity. We were spiritually dead, Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. And so how in the world can you bring yourself to life if you're dead? And so he teaches here this idea of, of boy, um, God was the initiator. But watch this now. I want to share with you guys today about your union with Christ, about being unified. I want you all to celebrate because of a supernatural relationship instead of a pseudo natural relationship. Smile at me. Type supernatural relationship into your chat. I want you all to celebrate at Christmas time and all this month. But if you're a Christ follower, you can enjoy a supernatural relationship. Why? Because he made us alive together with Christ rather than a pseudo natural relationship. Well, Pastor, what do you mean a pseudo natural relationship? See, our society is not as into relationships as much as we think we are. We become so confused that we get inspired and encouraged because we think we got friends that are characterized by Facebook. We become confused because we think that when somebody like us in social media, they really like us. Smile at me now. We become confused, but we think that, boy, because we've got quote unquote followers, they are really following us. You know, every once in a while, somebody will make a post and they'll make a post, and but they'll, they'll, they'll have this big old long post. I say, you know what? If you read to this point, I want to just check and see if you're still reading the post. And, and boy, if you're reading it, boy, repost it on your page, or boy, put something on um, your, 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 your favorite color, the city you were born in on the chat. And most people don't even read um, through that long post because most people who say they're following you are not really following you. We live in a world of pseudo natural relationships. But as a Christ follower, we have an opportunity to have a supernatural relationship. So watch this now. Y'all still with me? The scholars call this union with Christ. They call it union with Christ. You know, when I was in college, we used to always talk about, boy, I'm going to go down to the union. The union was a place of connection. The union was a place to eat. It was a place of fellowship. It was a place to party. I mean, well, it was a place to socialize intensively. And so watch that, boy. It was a place to party, right? So watch this now. We would go to you. God has given you a union, and God wants you to have union. God wants you to have connection with him. God's given you a new SIM card for identification, for information, for communication, for access and authorization to connect with him. And so, boy, we ought to be celebrating that God has given us this incredible access and relationship with him. So here's the problem. Watch it now. We have a bunch of Christians who understand their position 
in Christ. But don't understand their possessions in Christ. They understand the positional nature of their relationship with Christ, but they don't benefit from the personal nature of their relationship with Christ. So why do we go astray sometimes? Because watch this now, it's not because the positional is not true, it's because the personal is not being emphasized. It's because the personal is not being realized. And so watch this now. Um, I want to show you guys about this union in Christ, this connection with Christ. I want to share the barriers to the union with Christ the beginning of our union with Christ, the basis of our union with Christ, the briefing of our union with Christ, the benefits of our union with Christ. I'm going to be preaching for a while today. Go ahead, boy, get you a knapsack and get you a backpack. <laughs> That's probably, that a lot of stuff. But watch this now. We've got to understand this incredible union relationship that we have with Christ. Paul summarizes in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. No longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. The life I now live, that word now is um, in an emphatic position in the Greek. I mean, boy, it's, it's boy, out of um, word order in the sentence. Boy, he's emphasizing now, 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 now. The life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. That's union with us. And so when we come here, boy, do we understand the power of the human well, 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 what are the barriers? Boy, there's some barriers to a union with Christ. The issue is not one of responsibility, but ability and capacity. When you come to Christ, he gives you a new, um, a new SIM card. But well, that's some barriers. Our culture, our society have five primary enemies to our union, our relationship with Christ. Number one is materialism. It's not talking about money. What it's saying is that, boy, you don't need the supernatural. Our society teaches that you do not need the supernatural. The supernatural does not matter. All that matters is the physical, and all that matters is matter. Watch this now. It also teaches humanism. You know what, boy, at the core of the earth is, is boy, humanity and man and what man can do and man's thoughts and man's... Well, we couldn't even figure out a virus. Tell me about what, what can man... Man is limited, and God made it clear this year. A third thing is moralism. We think it's all about um, 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 improvement rather than transformation. God is not just interested in improving your life. God wants to transform your life. If any man be in uh, um, Christ, he's a new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. How many of us are settling for improvement rather than transformation? I need God to transform me. I think it was Tony, Tony, Tony says, Lord, make me over. Lord, make me over again. God wants to make you over. But boy, the barrier number one, watch this now, is um, materialism. Barrier number two is humanism. A third barrier is moralism. A fourth barrier is legalism. All I got to do is just keep the law and do everything right. The reality is you cannot keep the law. James chapter 1 says that, boy, if you're guilty, what? Listen to me now. James says, boy, if you're guilty in part of the law, you're guilty of the whole thing. So, boy, maybe you don't steal. Maybe you don't drink. Maybe you don't smoke. Maybe you don't do whatever else. But watch this now. There is something you do do. That didn't come out right. Clean it up on your own. All right. All right. And there's, something that, <laughs> there's something you do that you should not do. All right. It's about to be all right. But watch this now. God, if you're guilty in part, you are guilty of all of it. So we all need Christ. We all need a Savior. But the good news is he invites us to a relationship. I think a, I think a fifth barrier is this thing called deism, that God created us and then God just left us here by our own machinations and to fend for oneself. No, that's not what God has done. God is with believers by his spirit. These are barriers to one. Well, but what was the beginning of our union with Christ? See, watch this now. Babies are cute, but they're born sinners. That's why they keep you up all night. <laughs> that's why they need you at the most inconvenient times. That's why they're so expensive, right? Because they're sinners. Why was that? The Bible says, boy, we were born in sin. We were shaping this. You were not born a believer. You might have been born at the church, but the church was not born in you when you were born. You were born a non-believer. You were born a non christ So, boy, what is the beginning of this union? In, in, in verse 5, it says here, boy, but we were made alive together with Christ. Watch this now. The Bible teaches that the beginning of this union is when Christ made you alive. You say, well, pastor, I was born alive. He's talking about being spiritually alive. 
You were not born spiritually alive. You became spiritually alive when you were reborn, and then now you have access to God. Now you have a relationship with God because you've been reborn. Galatians 2.20 teaches that you vicariously participated in Christ's death. Remember, I have been crucified with Christ. Well, boy, I ain't seen nobody 2,000 years old. I did a funeral of, of, of a lady. I, I, I didn't know her personal, but, but, but I had great respect after I read her, after I read her obituary. She was 99 years old. She was one of 16 kids. She had eight kids herself. She's got 72 grandchildren. I mean, I was just impressed with her legacy. But the reality is, watch this now. We, we, we live vicariously through Christ. Well, but what does that mean? That means that, boy, God gives you credit for what Christ has done for you when you believe in Christ. God gives you credit. God gives you legitimate credit, not cheating credit. Now look on somebody's paper and write down the answer. God gives you legitimate credit for what Christ has done on your behalf. It's the doctrine of representation. And so watch this now, Galatians 2.20 says that you vicariously participated in Christ's death. So boy, this union, this connection, this relationship gains you access to what Christ has done. Colossians 2 and 12 teaches that believers were raised with Christ through faith in the powerful working of God. So watch this now, Colossians, let's just turn to Colossians chapter 2, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians chapter 2. Um, verse 12. 2 verse 12 says this. It says, it says, having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. John 63 teaches this, that, that it is the spirit that gives life and the flesh is of no avail. If the flesh is of no avail, why do we put so much effort into the flesh? Because we've been duped, we've been hoodwinked, we've been bamboozled. We are into religion and not into relationship. We are reading what people have said rather than reading what God has said. God has made you alive together with Christ and now you have union in him because of him and now with him. And so the question becomes, are you, are you reaching your full capacity? Because of that relationship. John 6, 63 teaches that it is the spirit that gives life and the flesh is no avail. John eleven twenty five 25 teaches that anyone who believes in Christ shall never die. John 14, 19 teaches that because he lives, believers shall live also. You know, boy, I think the old folks had this song, right? Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives. Okay, 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 okay. Here, here we go again. Another song, right? So watch now, watch now. God wants you to have a supernatural relationship rather than just a pseudo-natural relationship. Well, but what is the basis of our union in Christ? The basis of our union as believers in Christ is our regeneration in Christ. Um, 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 Bruce Damaris says in his book, um, 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 The Cross of Christ, he says, regeneration in Christ was the end of the old and the beginning of the new. It's about personal identification with the Savior. Romans 6, 3 through 11 references being dead to sin, but alive to God. Romans, um, I'm sorry, Ephesians 2, 13 portrays believers as in Christ, in Christo. That boy, now you have a new relationship with Christ. You've got a new proximity with Christ. You've got a new personal relationship with him. Galatians 2 and 20 references Christ in the believer. John 14, 12 references Jesus and the Father dwelling on the inside of believers. 2 Peter 1 and 4 references, references the believer partaking in God's divine nature. Guys, we serve an incredible God but who's worthy of incredible praise because he's invited us to an incredible relationship. How many of y'all recognize the gift that God has given you. God has given believers an incredible gift of relationship. Well, Pastor, what, what's the brief on this? What is the nature of you? Number one, 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says that, boy, it is a supernatural union. Let's turn there. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I told y'all we were going to turn there, didn't I? 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. I know we don't turn this much. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says this. 
For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. This union is not based upon your physical pedigree. It's not based upon your, your, your class, your economics, your education. It's, it's not based upon your grandma. It's based upon the spirit. He said, number, number one, it is a supernatural union. Number two, it is a vital union. And well, um, in John chapter 15, it talks about the, the, the vine and the branches and that, boy, the, the branches have life because they are connected to the vine. See, guys, um, um, we can only bear fruit in God to the degree we are dependent upon the vine. And he says, in him you shall bear much fruit. And what I our, our productivity is based upon our connectivity. You all know in this world of, um, of um, cell phones that, that no matter how powerful your phone is, if it can't connect to the tower, it's useless. Guys, you know what? I, I, I've given you a new SIM card so, boy, you can have identification, you can have inter, um, um, information, you can have communication, you can have authorization to access a divine tower named God. And so God says, watch this now. The basis of this is um, it's a supernatural union. It's a vital union. You need this connection to be spiritually fruitful. It is a mysterious union. Watch now. It's mysterious, but we can't figure out exactly how God does it. It is an eternal union. What shall separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus? Nothing. I am persuaded neither death nor life, angels or principalities, things present nor things to come shall separate us from the love of God. What is you know what? You thought losing that job separated you. You thought going through that divorce separated you. You thought committing that bad sin separated you. You thought because you speed sometime and will get tickets that separate you. Smile at me. There is nothing that can separate the believer from the love of God. And you ought to celebrate the power of that relationship with him. Wonder working power. It just sounds good just saying it, don't I wish I had an organ right now. I say, put me in B. All right. <laughs> it's a supernatural union. It's a vital union. It's a mysterious. Watch this now. It is an eternal union. It's a spiritual union. It's what God says. It's a predetermined union. It is a purpose. You were created unto good works. It's a purposeful union. God wants some of you. Watch this now. Um, Bruce DeMera suggests this union. It was planned in eternity past. It's objectively factualized in Christ. It's realized by the baptizing ministry of the Spirit. So what are, what are some of the benefits of union with Christ? You get access to God. You receive abundance from God. You receive ability from God. You receive the anointing of God, and then you can abide in God. Well, but what in the world are the blessings of you? What can, what can I look forward to if I abide in Christ and he and me and in this relationship and this connection and us hanging out together? You know what? One of the drawbacks of, of, our, of our highly technological society is that, is that boy, we, don't, we don't fully benefit from personal relationship and personal connection. Now, isn't it funny? You'll see, you'll see kids these days, and boy, you'll see them hang out together, and boy, they'll be standing together, talking, doing whatever, and they'll be texting one another. And they stand right next to each other. Why are you texting when you can be talking? Because, boy, we become so sophisticated. We become so technological that, boy, we have gotten away from that which is personal. You know, Back in the day, we used, to, we used to emphasize the importance of writing letters because writing letters were so personal. It took time, it took effort, it took thought just to write a letter. Now everything is automated. You know, but you hit a button, two, two seconds later, boy, you got a thank you note, you got a welcome note, you got a, because everything is so impersonal. You know, God offers us a personal relationship it will never become antiquated. It will never go out of style. It will never lose its power. It will never fade away. 
It can never be taken away from you. It will always regenerate you. It will always revitalize you. It will always renew you. It will always keep you connected. When you fall, it will come search for you and pick you back up again. It will remind you of God's grace. It will remind you of God's love. It will remind you of your identity in Christ. It will remind you that there's a kingdom that comes after this kingdom. It will remind you of who God is. So my time is up, but I ain't got no time. I still got word. That's a problem. Smile at me. So boy, here are 26 blessings of union with Christ. Number one, you are accepted in Christ. And, um, but we find a bunch of these in Ephesians chapter one. You are accepted in Christ. You are blessed by God. You are chosen by God. You've been delivered by God. You've been emancipated and freed by God. You've been forgiven and filled by his Holy Spirit. You've been gifted and glorified. You've been healed and you've been helped. You've been indwelt by his Holy Spirit. You've been justified in God. You are now known by God. You are loved by God. You are made alive by God. He he has given you newness of life. He's made you an overcomer. He has purified you. He's given you a new quest. He's redeemed you. He's sanctified you. He's transformed you into his likeness. He has united you to Christ. He's given you victory over death. He's made you a witness of his person and his power. And he has excluded you from a Christless eternity. He's given you a zeal for his kingdom. Yeah. Yeah. We serve an incredible God who's worthy of incredible praise because he's given us an incredible relationship with him. Don't settle for a pseudo natural relationship when God has given us the benefits of a supernatural relationship. Father, we come to you now, Lord Jesus. And God, I said a lot today. Concepts from your word, Father. God, take these concepts and these constructs and help us, God, to not just hear them and understand them, but to acquiesce to them. To assimilate, God, this concept, God, of a supernatural relationship into our lives. And so, God, we've seen this year, God, how fragile life can be. Your job can be gone. Your home can be gone. Your travel can be gone. You can become sequestered to the size of your home overnight. But, God, the relationship has not been diminished. So I want to pray, God, that we emphasize relationship. I pray, God, what only you can do, Father. Help us draw closer to you. Help us to spend time with you. I have been crucified with Christ. God, that's a big statement. That means, God, it's not really about religion. It's about a relation. It's, it's about what Christ has done for us. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. So God, we're not alone. It's not based solely upon what we can conjure. It's based upon what you can do. So I want to pray, God, that you would do exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond. 